Good morning, everybody. Um, I'll just give you a second to come in and get settled. Um, firstly, just starting off, uh, thank you everybody for arriving and uh, thank you for our panelists for um, agreeing to speak with us today. Um, just moving on to the, uh, so our panel has actually changed slightly today. Unfortunately, Dr. Kevin Murrock uh, can't be here. But we've got myself, I'm going to be hosting today's session. Uh, my name is Ian Dara. I'm a first year PhD candidate uh, based in Dublin City University. Um, we've got uh, Dr. Vandre uh, Figuier. I'm sorry, Vandre, I butchered your sir. I was, I was nervous about this already. Um, Dr. Vandre Figuierdo from the University yep. of, uh, of Kentucky. And uh, we've also got Professor Bina, uh, Bettina Mittendorfer uh, as well um, from uh, Washington University at St. Louis. Um, so just kind of a bit of housekeeping stuff. So kind of the, the flow of how today is going to work. Uh, I'm going to give a, a brief introduction and some housekeeping stuff just about the virtual uh, journal club and what will be going on today. Uh, I'm going to discuss why I selected this paper and just some kind of what I thought was interesting about it. Uh, Vandre is then going to give us some uh, 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 20 to 25 minute presentation uh, on the paper itself. Uh, the, the rationale behind it, uh, some of the pertinent findings. Um, Bettina will then comment kind of on the, the, I guess, the technical and the kind of quality of the paper itself uh, and why it was kind of considered um, to be of standard to be published in the Journal of Physiology. We'll have a Q&A that should run for about 10 or 15 minutes, uh, followed by a networking kind of extended Q&A discussion session for about 30 minutes uh, at the end of the session. On the networking session, just towards the end, there will be a link put in the chat. You're free to join that. You're not obliged to. And that will be more like a more informal Zoom call uh, whereby everyone's face will be visible uh, and, and we can kind of chat informally just um, some kind of other housekeeping stuff. Today's session is being recorded, just the, the presentation portion, not the breakout session. Uh, your webcams are not visible. Uh, it'll just be us that's visible. Um, there's going to be a Q&A at the end. You can submit questions from any time on, from, from now onward, um, and you're free to do so. When you are submitting Q&A, you just use the little Q&A box, which should be in the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, please add your name and institution if you feel comfortable to do so. I think it just adds to the, the kind of social and collaborative effort of the Journal Club. Uh, please upvote questions from other people that you think are valuable. Uh, and then finally, you will be emailed uh, uh, the recording of this um, discussion uh, sometime within the next week uh, or so. Uh, and then just lastly, uh, if you yourself would like to be involved in the Journal Club, there's both the traditional written Journal Club or the now kind of novel, but it's almost a year now, virtual Journal Club hosted by the Journal of Physiology. Uh, please, if you have any questions, contact the, the events um, end of the, the society or um, this email, which I actually don't know what it's for, but please contact either of these email addresses if you're interested in hosting the, the virtual journal club or, or writing a submit, uh, a written submitted one. So just briefly, I'm going to talk about why I selected this paper for, for my session, which I'm hosting today and what I thought was appealing about it. Um, the, the lab I'm based in, I, I, I study skeletal muscle adaptation to, to exercise. Um, that's my area. And just this is kind of a, 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 a relatively popular review paper that was published almost 10 years ago now that kind of outlines on a conceptual level um, what the, the mechanisms of skeletal muscle adaptation to exercise kind of may be. And it's essentially characterized by uh, a gradual increase in protein content, which is stimulated by these episodes or by episodic repeated bouts of exercise. For me uh, personally, I had always kind of considered the, the process of exercise adaptation to be essentially exclusively regulated by these surges of transcriptional and in the case of resistance exercise, translational activity um, that are initiated by an acute exercise bout. What I like about this paper and what kind of attracted me to this paper is I, I think Vandre and his colleagues have really endeavored to talk about or to, to try and uncover more protractive, uh, more protracted adaptive processes that essentially occur in the periods between these surges or the periods between acute exercise bouts, uh, specifically ribosome biogenesis, which is something that I've only recently become aware of, but um, has kind of become, I think, 
gradually more popularized over maybe the last seven or eight years, perhaps longer, Vandre might comment on. Um, and this is based off observations such as the attached, like in response to resistance training, you see an increase in kind of ribosome, or sorry, RNA um, synthesis uh, at rest. So an RNA synthesis, this is kind of a proxy for ribosome biogenesis, as well as um, things like changes in re resting protein turnover kinetics within skeletal muscle. So marginally elevated muscle protein synthesis and marginally depressed muscle protein breakdown. And again, these two would be in or it would be at least somewhat linked biologically, whereas the assumption here, this is in a post-absorptive state that muscle protein um, that, that there's no stimulus for muscle protein synthesis here, so that it has to be maybe associated with an increase for translational capacity. Um, kind of tying this into resistance training adaptation, then very quickly, you know, for me exclusively, I would have considered um, the mechanism of hypertrophy to basically be characterized by these surges in muscle protein synthesis that I'm sure we're all kind of familiar with seeing a graph like this, whereby either feeding, training, or feeding and training in combination produce these large surges of muscle protein synthesis. Um, and essentially, it's the accumulation of all of these curves over days, weeks, months, that would be your kind of, uh, would be kind of related to the, or proportional to the amount of hypertrophy you would experience. It doesn't seem to really add up in evidence uh, or in the literature. And I think what, what Vandre has done quite well, actually, in this review paper is, is talk about things that might be occurring in the background with ribosome biogenesis being the, the particular factor, i.e. an enhanced translational capacity, perhaps coupled with the surges of protein synthesis in response to acute exercise, but also uh, in the interim between these surges, uh, producing kind of a marginal, but maybe continual or gradual accretion of protein, which may produce hypertrophy. So just on my last slide here, why I chose this paper was I think they've done a they've they've endeavored to do a very high quality effort of understanding um, kind of on several different levels signals which may function to kind of regulate this process. Uh, firstly, in the the acute exercise period, so it, with close proximity to uh, uh, exercise bouts, but also in the early protracted period as well. So extending beyond. Um, the kind of uh, primary recovery period from acute exercise bout. And they do that looking at innate factors, i.e. some genetic factors, signal transduction and acute transcriptional responses, but also epigenetic factors as well. And I think the authors really try to parse together here how these signals may integrate um, to kind of give an idea of what this early response may be. And I think there's going to be, I actually have a lot of questions relating what would happen with successive exercise bouts and stuff like that here. Um, but I think I've talked enough, so I'll let Vandre take over. But I think, again, that these are the, 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 the interesting elements of this paper for me. Thank you so much, Jan, for this uh, nice introduction. Uh, you, you did a pretty, pretty good job to, to lay down the foundations <laughs> of this. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, uh, so we're going to be talking today about this, uh, the genetic and epigenetic regulation of muscle ribosome biogenesis with, with exercise. Uh, and uh, as, as Ian said, this is like a new kind of area. And uh, uh, maybe the last 10 years, perhaps, we have been more interested in this regulation of ribosome biogenesis. And this is uh, changing a little bit of the field instead of, of like, uh, acute changes with one or two bouts, meaning, you know, like the, the, the result of, of the adaptation to exercise is just within the 24 hours or 48 hours of the rule. Uh, this Repsone by genes perhaps put, put a, 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 a more complex view on the regulation of muscle Repsone by genesis because the effects are more long lasting uh, in, into the muscle. So basically uh, th this, this paper that was just accepted in journal physiology was like a, a, a group endeavor from different, different universities and from us here in the University of Kentucky, but also Indiana University. And also we had like a, a team in, in Sweden, the Karolinska Institute and the Linchampin University in Sweden. And th this work probably wouldn't be able to get done if it was not for, for all these people that work collaboratively to get this, uh, this study done. So wh what was the rationale for us to, to uh, for this study? So as Ian said before, uh, resistance exercise uh, promotes, we know that resistance exercise promotes 
hypertrophy, and but the molecular mechanisms are not yet fully elucidated. Perhaps uh, we had a few candidates, and maybe all of them are integrated, or the, one of the, they regulate each other. But maybe we have the short-term muscle protein synthesis that occur within 24 hours, a few hours after exercise, and will last for 24 hours or 48 hours. Maybe uh, my nuclear accretion via satellite cell is another one that has been on for quite a while. But ribosome biogenesis has emerged in the last few years as a main mechanism regulating muscle hypertrophy. And that, that basically is via translational capacity. So when you talk about ribosome biogenesis, just to, to point that, it's basically the synthesis of new ribosomes from scratch. So uh, what do we think occurs uh, with one resistant exercise stimulus is that that will promote intracellular signaling transduction, like you probably heard already, mTOR is one of them, the, the most known, I guess, but also have other ones like MAP kinase or ERK pathways. And this signaling transduction pathways will lead to increased short-term protein synthesis, which is basically the, your existing ribosomes will engage in translation. So you got, you're gonna have increased translation, translation uh, rounds per ribosomes, and that will lead <clears throat> to this increased short-term protein synthesis that uh, we, have, we know this for maybe two, three uh, decades already that it, this occurs. And that is what we call translational efficiency. So you don't change the pool of ribosomes, but those ribosomes be become more active and engage in translation more. <clears throat> but also we have now found more recently that there is also upregulation of ribosome biogenesis at the same time, which is basically transcription of the ribosomal DNA. And that leads eventually leads to increased ribosome content, which will uh, lead to increased protein synthesis rate uh, at rest because we have now more ribosomes to engage in translation. So this perhaps will translate into more protein synthesis at rest, postprandial, post for example, that's one. And that has been shown already for a nice paper that actually you and you and showed, showed it before. And also <clears throat> that what we, what we call translational capacity. Um, <clears throat> so basically there is now a, a, a we have sufficient evidence to demonstrate that ribosomal DNA transcription, which is the uh, bottleneck step for ribosomal biogenesis, occur following mechanical overload in mice, like the synergist synergistic ablation is one of them, but also resistant exercise in humans as well. And from the literature so far, we can say that ribosomal biogenesis occur following perhaps, it starts going uh, uh, up following perhaps four hours post exercise, but it will remain up RDNA transcription until 24 hours. And, and there is also evidence of 48 hours. We don't know much after that, but then within the two days, we know that uh, some of the DNA transcription is enhanced. 24 hours in particular is the, the time point where we, we have more evidence that is upgraded. And then as uh, we've accumulated bouts of resistance exercise, so uh, each uh, session will increase the by genesis, and then uh, eventually it will increase your translational capacity. So the, the amount of ribosomes you have in the muscle and that will translate into more protein synthesis. But it, it's important to pin, pinpoint here that um, ribosome RNA is like the most abundant RNA in, in, in any cell. So that's why sometimes um, this will take a long time because 80, 90% of, of the total RNA is basically ribosome RNA. So that's why these changes are slow and, and takes time. Uh, <clears throat> So it's very unlikely, for example, that uh, if you take a specific mRNA, it can change several folds or thousands of folds with resistance exercise because they are so much less abundant with so with uh, ribosome RNA that takes a long time. <clears throat> so another thing that we are interested in, or what was a rational for us, is that uh, people have shown now, or other researchers have found that there is a large heterogeneity of resistance exercise training induced muscle growth with exercise. <clears throat> so perhaps we can say that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, uh, muscle hypertrophy is uh, uh, normal distributed, if you will, in the population. So you can see here on the, on the left side that in young subjects, and all, but also in middle-aged people and also aged uh, individuals, there is a large response to mechanical, uh, sorry, to resistance exercise. So people will gain muscle mass uh, very differently, even though they receive the same amount of uh, muscle growth, or sorry, uh, same amount of resistance exercise dose or volume or intensity, even 
even if those, I'm sorry, are all the same, they will gain very different amounts of muscle mass. And this has been shown by other groups as well. And the previous slide was from uh, CSA, like a CT scan, if I, if I pro remember correctly. But in here, this is fiber type, like uh, fiber type CSA, for example, the uh, fiber two type, uh, sorry, uh, myofiber two and uh, one as well. Both of them, their uh, individuals will respond very different. Some, some of them will actually even decrease muscle uh, myofiber size with resistance size. So it's very, very, um, uh, there is a very a great uh, variability in response to resistance exercise. And one of the things that we, we have been thinking about, about looking at that data is that there is another thing that is also uh, varies a lot with, with uh, in the population. So this, uh, this is like one repeat of ribosomal DNA. So if you remember uh, genomics, so most of the genes that we have, the protein coding genes that we have in our genome, most of them are that we only have two copies for most of them. So the RNA the gene is different. We have hundreds or thousands of this, of this gene in our genome. And uh, we have them across five different chromosomes. I, if I remember correctly, it's uh, chromosome 12, 13, 14, or 13, 14, 15, 21, and 22. So we have this uh, many, uh, and then within each chromosome, you have like repeats. So they're not like, uh, they're one after the other. So you have the IGS, which is the internal, uh, internal genomic spacer. And then you have the actual uh, ribosomal RNA, which will become the ribosome. So this is the small one here is the 18S, but also you have the smallest one here, uh, 5.8S and 28S. Then you have another intergenic spacer and another RDNA. So this happens hundreds or even thousands of times in our genome. So we found, uh, or uh, actually Gibbons et al. 2014 found that there is a very big uh, difference across populations. So these are two different populations here. They, they don't matter for us right now, but they are two different populations. And you can see that in, in populations, uh, there is a, mar, a very big, uh, sorry, there is a large variability in uh, ribosomal DNA dosage in this subject. So you can have someone with, uh, I don't know, 75 copies and other ones with uh, 400. So there's a, big, a very big spread in the RDNA copy number in subjects. And if you look at the, on the left side here, so they measure RDNA by this, uh, for the different uh, uh, parts of the RDNA, because it's a very long, uh, uh, very long DNA or gene. So you can see here 5.8s, 28s. So they're pretty, they are there is a, a big correlation between each other. So uh, meaning that they they're probably are functional. So and you can see here, if you take this subject here on the on the bottom side, like maybe less than a fun, uh, five uh, one hundred copies, and you take another one on the other end, uh, four times more genes than the other one. So if you, if you apply the same dose of resistance exercise to them, would they, they respond differently? So that was our main question here. So our hypothesis were, uh, does resistance exercise, but not endurance, promote ribosome biogenesis? Is ribosome biogenesis specific to, to uh, resistance exercise and not endurance, for example? And is muscle ribosome biogenesis in response to resistance exercise related to RDNA copy number? And uh, resistance exercise affects RDNA promoter modulation because epigenetics is also involved uh, in the regulation of ribosome biogenesis in other cell types. So we are interesting, interested to see whether this also occurs with mechanical stimulation or, or muscle growth. So the aims of our study were to determine whether resistance exercise and endurance exercises promotes different responses on muscle ribosome biogenesis, determine whether the ribosomal DNA copy number dosage affects muscle ribosome muscle ribosome biogenesis and that remind whether exercise changes the genetic landscape of the RDNA promoter region. So, uh, so we had 30 subjects for this study, 10 performed or 20 performed exercise, 10 uh, cycling and the other 10 resistant exercise. And we took biopsies at three 30 minutes post, three hours, eight hours and 24 hours post exercise in these subjects. And another 10 subjects served as controls. So the resistance exercise was basically uh, uh, leg press and the extension for uh, four sets, each exercise. And the uh, endurance exercise was 45, 45 minutes of cycling at 70% of the estimated VO2 max. And of course the controls were on exercise group. And we had 18 males and 20, uh, 12 males. So uh, six males and four females per group. 
and uh, their age was varied between 18 and 50, but all of them were recreational active. <clears throat> so after the muscle biopsies were taken, we froze them down, but later on we extract protein, RNA, and DNA. Protein, we did a, a facilitation and status of several kinases involved in, in muscle growth, or sorry, in uh, anabolic signaling. RNA, we did pre-ribosome RNA as a measurement of ribosome biogenesis, and some mRNA levels as well. And for DNA, we did a whole genome sequencing and also coupled with uh, PCR to measure RDNA dosage. And for methylation status, we, measure, we used the typer and the RBS, or the bisulfate uh, sequencing for the methylation. <clears throat> so first of all, uh, when measuring the, the signaling transduction involved in each pathway, uh, you can see here that uh, this is the endurance exercise. 30 minutes after endurance exercise, we saw an increase in AMPK signaling, which was exclusively on the endurance exercise, and we didn't, didn't see changes in resistance exercise, and this makes sense. So uh, IMPK seems to be more related to endurance exercise. And then when you look at the P70 S6 kinase, a threonine 39, which is a directly target, directly targeted by mTOR complex one, but is your canonical mTOR pathway. So 30 minutes and eight hours were upregulated only in resistance exercise at three and uh, sorry, 30 minutes and three and uh, eight hours. And there was a, a increase here at 24 hours in the control, which probably was related to feeding. But also the data for the P70 P70S6 kinase at 39 was associated as well with the RPS6 uh, serine 2040 244, which is a, a direct target by uh, P70 itself, which uh, pretty much does reflects the same thing as the, the above uh, data. So we're confident that uh, endurance exercise promoted IMPK and that uh, uh, resistance exercise promoted, um, resistant, uh, sorry, promoted uh, anabolic signaling such as mTOR complex one activity. And then later we measured uh, CIMIC expression, which is a known transcriptional factor involved in several thousands uh, is, sorry, it's regulated. It regulates thousands of genes as a master regulator of transcription, if you will. And has been also found to be increased with resistance exercise. And then we, we also demonstrated that that's the case in our samples here because it was upregulated at three hours in the resistance exercise group and as well at eight hours, although there was some subjects in the endurance group that also responded at uh, eight hours. And then it was back to normal levels at 24 hours. And then, uh, but you can see here that the robust changes like this is like several thousand fold increase in the three hours. And when you look at 45S, which is the, the first transcript from the ribosomal DNA transcription, the first uh, that we can measure, you can see that endurance actually reduced at 30 minutes, uh, the, the, the 45S levels at 30 minutes, no change in, in, air, uh, in uh, 30 minutes, which seems to be pretty uh, consistent with the literature. But then at three hours, we say increase uh, at three hours in the resistance exercise group. And later on at 24 hours, there was also an increase compared to the other groups uh, of 45S levels. So again, consistent with the literature. And again, even though this increase might be modest for like, not, it's not like 7,000 fold, like the CMIC or other mRNA levels, it's important to highlight that these are really abundant uh, RNA. So, you don't expect to see huge differences. Uh, 50% or 20% is, is a lot of uh, copies being transcribed for, for this case for 45S. So then uh, when looking at the promoter, since the promoter is, uh, is involved in transcription of the RDNA, you can see here, so you have several, you have uh, dozens of the copy in, in specific region, and you have the promoter region just before the actual gene or I mean, this is part of the gene, but before the, the, the part that will be transcribed. And we have several uh, CPG islands here that can be uh, methylated. And we analyzed those ones and using that typer. And as you can see here, that the RDNA methylation status in the promoter region uh, seems to be consistent across subjects. So if one subject, here, for example, here, site one is uh, hypermethylated, he will be also hypermethylated for the other regions. And when they are hypometylated, they are also hypometylated for the other regions as well. But then you can do a, a average of the RDNA methylation status, and most of them 
uh, you can see that on average, the promoter, promoter uh, RDNA promoter are uh, hypomethylated because on average you have like what, 22-ish on average is the methylation pattern of the RDNA. And as you can see, they are, uh, so that, what, what this means is that you have like in on average 80, 70% of the RDNA is actually hypomethylated so they are actually avail available for transcription. So um, it's interesting to see that, uh, that maybe the most, the majority of the genes in the muscle are actually available for transcription. And so that leaves less room for, for, for hypomethylation in this case. And that is actually what you found. The RDNA methylation didn't change with exercise, sorry, the, the methylation of the promoter region didn't change with exercise. Uh, in either in either endurance or, or resistance exercise. So this means uh, this means that uh, RDNA promoter methylation may not be associated, or they, they may not change with resistance exercise at least at least acutely with one bout of exercise. We don't know what happens chronically, but um, but this is consistent as well with other cell types. Uh, we have there are papers on cancer, for example, showing that even though in cancer cells they might have enhanced by genesis that is not associated with uh, promoter methylation status. So, so uh, th this is consistent, I guess. <clears throat> but then we use the bisulfate uh, sequencing to look at the other regions of the RDNA uh, gene that is not the promoter. You actually see some 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 uh, sites, for example, this enhancer site here that was downregulated or hypomethylated at 30 minutes post exercise. So for this, because of the this is really uh, complex you know, technology. So we, we only did 30 minutes and 34 hours to pick up these two sites to do this. And we only did it in a subset of eight subjects. There was this exercise group. <coughs> and we see that uh, there was down, uh, down regulation of methylation status or, or actually hypermethylation at 30 minutes and 24 hours in this specific site at ver the very end of the RDNA in the interogenic spacer or very end for one gene, but perhaps is the initiation of the other. This, the next gene was downregulated here, which is also an interesting as well. Some um, <clears throat> interogenic spacer where it's uh, known that MIC will bind to those targets, but that will, uh, uh, in this specific position here, was hypermethylated 30 minutes, but then later on it uh, went back to normal levels at 24 hours. And that was also the case for these other two sites at the, the position 27603 and 27614 in the RDNA gene in the intergenic spacer that is also known to be associated with MIC that was also uh, hypomethylated and kind of remained hypo in the 24 hours post-exercise. And uh, next we were interested in, oh, and just, uh, just to, so we have also, which I'm not presenting here because of the time, because of the time, we have a lot of data as well on the RDNA methylation status in mice. So we did mechanical overload. So there's a, another bunch of, a lot of data on the mechanical overload induced hypomethylation of this same or similar uh, region, specifically the enhancer region and the, the meek associated uh, intergenic spacer that is also hypomethylated in mouse following mechanical overload. So we did a bunch of uh, validation or, or confirmation of these sites uh, using um, my nuclear only prep, so only using my nuclear. So we we, did, we didn't have fibroblasts, for example, for those analyses. So that that was important as well to show that this is specific to my nuclear and not fibroblasts or other cell types that exist in, in, in muscle. <clears throat> so next we did uh, whole genome sequencing, and then we uh, confirmed those. Actually, we we started with PCR, but later on we confirmed our PCR. Uh, RDNA copy number by whole genome sequencing. And as you can see in our population here, uh, so both of the technologies were, were uh, correlated with each other. So we are, uh, we are happy to, to see that. And so we were able to move to our all subjects. And we did, uh, so you can see that the RDNA dosage in this in our subjects were similar to the, to the literature that found in that there's a variability in the population where one subject is very low, another one is really high, uh, uh, possessing RDNA copy numbers in this, in this subject. So then when you look at the, inter, the, the association between each, each gene, for example, 18S region versus 28S, and so on with 
five polluters, there is a nice correlation, meaning that those, yeah, it's like this similar to the other the previous paper, they are really nice correlated, uh, the, the, part, the inner parts of the ribosomal DNA. That's just to show that uh, we probably are measuring what we are we thinking we are measuring. And uh, basically, when we do that and we analyze uh, ribosomal DNA copy number with the 45S at 24 hours, we see a nice correlation with, with copy number and uh, 45S expression. And we didn't we didn't found with uh, three hours, but we did found with 24 hours. And we also did some correlations with, for example, P70 S6 kinase oscillation levels that was not correlated as well. So for us, this seems to indicate that uh, the increase in 24 hours post exercise is related, sorry, the amount, the, the increase in 45S that we observe with exercise is related to copy number. So the more copies that you have, the more copies of ribosomal DNA you have, the, the biggest will be, the ch chances are that your response will be bigger with someone with lower uh, copy number. <clears throat> so the conclusions from this study is that RNA transcription is enhanced only after this exercise, not endurance. So this uh, this is interesting to see because that may may help explain the differences in the phenotype that occurs following chronic training. RNA transcription is related to RNA copy number dosage. So the more again, the more the more copies you have, the bigger will be your response likely. Uh, methylation of RDNA promoter does not change with exercise. At least, the pro uh, sorry, yeah, that's the promoter which doesn't seem to be changing much with exercise. Because, but I mean, that makes sense based on the fact that most of the genes are already hypomethylated to begin with. And the uh, methylation status of other regions of RDNA following exercise seems to be actually changing. And we know much less about those regions, but they, they are interesting to see that uh, some regions get high. And actually, I should say that some regions actually get hypermethylated. So there is a lot of to, to, to dig in into those data because some regions become hypo, some is, uh, regions become uh, hypermethylated following resistance exercise in humans. But specifically, those regions associated with MIC are uh, hypermethylated in those enhancer regions of the RDNA. <clears throat> so the implications of our study is that uh, skeletal muscle mass regulation has longer been hypothesized. We, we know this for, for a very long time. People have to hypothesize that there is a genetic component to gains in muscle mass. And we believe that RDNA copy number could be this genetic component or at least uh, uh, part of that. Of course, there is other genes, but people have so far focused on the protein coding genes that, uh, that could explain muscle growth. And we are proposing here the RDNA copy number may be part of the gen genetic component that could explain the heterogeneity in hypertrophic responses to resistance exercise. For example, people have been looking for this for a long time, the low and high responders to resistance exercise, why some people respond less and others respond high to the same stimulus. And uh, RDNA promoter methylation may not uh, that, that be a that, that, uh, determinant for some biogenesis acutely, but some other sites might be part of the what we people call cellular muscle memory. So if those methylation status remain for a long time, maybe those are part of the muscle memory effect that we, we also, is a known phenomenon in the muscle field. So we need to acknowledge, uh, I need to acknowledge, of course, all the, the, the authors of this paper. We, we couldn't have done without all of them. And unfortunately, both the, the senior authors, Ferdinand von Walden and Kevin Murek, were not able to be here today, but uh, they, are, they are the co-senior papers of this, uh, they are co-senior co co authors of this paper. And of course, all the, the other authors, Yuan, Yuan, Bjorn, Rodrigo, Jessica, Ivan, Taylor, Brooks, Gabriel, Charlotte, and John, all of them uh, helped us to get this at the finish line. And of course, we need to acknowledge the funding for, for the NIH and also the Swedish counterpart as well for the funding or, or study. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Vandre. That was a great presentation. Um, just quickly, um, before I, I give it over to you, Bettina, um, if you have questions, um, I wouldn't mind if you started asking them now, just start dropping them into the chat box, um, just so we have a few loaded up for when we get to the Q&A at the end. Um, and I'll, I'll now pass over to um, Professor Bettina Mittendorfer, who is going to talk about uh, why this paper was selected for publication in the Journal of Physiology. Um, yeah, first of all, um, very, very nice presentations, both of you, Ian and uh, Wondre. I think that you really set the stage and there's um, um, very clear presentation. So 
I, I have to start out, I did not handle this paper I'm filling in essentially, um, but um, needless to say, I would have accepted it as well, I think. And um, really what's attractive with this type of paper is um, it's, it's a multidisciplinary, right? It, it, it touches on a novel concept. It really pushes the field into a new direction. And then as you've appreciated through the presentation, I mean, there's a lot of work going into it and this is really the direction the journal likes to go. And it's um, multidisciplinary, um, large groups of investigators. And, and, and this is something that um, science leads us to now. It's no longer single lab, single study kind of uh, work. It really takes a large team to produce these exceptional um, type of uh, results, right? That really move the field forward. And this is really, it's robust. It um, has the statistical power to detect um, the differences. So this is a key thing always, right? When you have um, data, um, how robust is the data that you can draw the conclusions. Um, it's backed up with um, mouse models, preclinical studies as well. So I think it's that combination of work, it's, it's really a well-rounded piece of work that goes in. And then a lot of course goes, which is often underappreciated, you can have the most fantastic work if the reading isn't good, right? If the presentation isn't clear, I think it is very hard to get this paper across the finishing line in any journal. The reviewers, right, have limited time. They're excited, they read the paper, but if it takes them a long time to kind of figure out what was done, what's the gist, it makes it harder, the criticism becomes harsher. Um, there's a lot of confusion. So I think start out with a really, really good draft um, and then get this across. And this was um, exemplary with the uh, presentations, both of you read very, very clear um, message, very nice presentation of the data um, to get this open, I think. So these are the key. And I, I don't know if you have anything to add or any particular questions, but this is sort of what the editors look for. Um. Thank you very much. Very complimentary. Uh, and of course, sorry, I'll just reiterate it again. Thank you to the both of you for, for agreeing to speak today. Um, still waiting on a few questions to come in, but I have a heap of them, Vandre. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so even if a few don't come in, we can keep a discussion going for a few minutes. Um, I, I, I like to ask more conceptual questions, so I'll, I'll apologize before I ask them. But one of the things I, I actually found the uh, the I guess only thinking about it in terms of the hypomethylation data, quite interesting. Um, and I, I know obviously it's, we're not supposed to kind of, I always just think hypomethylation equals enhanced transcripts. I know we're not supposed to do that, but I, I will for the sake of ease. I, I was curious then, what do you have any expectations what you might see in a secondary resistance exercise about then? So what I mean is, let's say you conducted the study as you've conducted it right now, after the 24 hour period, maybe the next day you do another bout, would you, do you think it would be expectable to see a, a subsequent enhanced response then in, in some of the factors? Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. We, to be honest, we don't know, but I, I would imagine that uh, with uh, repeated bouts, um, maybe transcription will be, will be easier, I guess, from, from, I mean, it's hard to say because it, it will depend on which region you're talking about. If you're talking about a promoter region, perhaps, as I said, it was already hypometastated to start with. So um, we don't know whether with chronic training, those will be hypermethylated perhaps or hypometylated. We actually don't know. <clears throat> but uh, I guess depends as well on the stimulus. If it is repeated bouts of the, uh, with progressive resistance training, perhaps maybe there's a chance that it will be hypometylated. <clears throat> but the other regions, the enhancer, and other regions associated with MIC, maybe there will be, uh, there, maybe there's a chance for those parts to be hypermethylated or, or, or even hyper, who knows, from the, in the long term. But uh, what, what is interesting to me as well that we didn't talk too much in the paper that um, might, there could be a, a relationship between the RDNA copy number with methylation. So for example, if I have uh, 1000 genes, but 20% uh, of them are closed and someone has uh, 400 copies, but I don't know, like 5%, 10% is, is hype, uh, uh, methylated. <clears throat> there is a chance that there is a, a, a synergistic, <clears throat> so not synergistic, sorry, but there is a chance that there might be um, <clears throat> uh, a relationship between methylation and RDNA copy number that even though I have more copies, none of them are if I am on the hypermethylation spectrum, maybe I'm not 
not all those copies are, are available. So there could be a, a, a scenario where um, training will affect methylation in someone that has already has high levels of methylation and they will get hypo, whereas someone that is already, uh, because we had subjects with 10% of methylation, those subjects want, want the, the, there's very little room for them to, to change methylation at the promoter, I, I should say. The other regions, uh, we don't know much about it yet, but could it be, could it be that they, they facilitate in the long term, uh, those enhancer regions, they get easier to, for transcription as as training goes, I guess. But on, uh, but again, that will depend entirely on the stimulus, I think. If it is the same the same um, stimulus, like uh, not progressive resistance training, then maybe it will actually not change much, perhaps. So, so there is actually some papers showing that 45S is increased in uh, acute following in untrained subjects and as as you go with the same stimulus chronically, that, that response actually is reduced. So could it be as well that we get actually hypermethylated in the long term, perhaps. Um, yeah, that's actually quite interesting because if, if I'm understanding what you're, you're saying correctly, let's let's say I, I'm born with a higher RDA, uh, sorry, ribosomal DNA copy number than you, but I never train. So I'm, I'm let's just say through my lifestyle, quite highly methylated, at least in the relative sense, but you have a substantially lower RDNA copy number, but you train a lot and you have, so you, you might have in totality access to, or, or greater yeah. transcriptional potential than I do through your, so you can kind of, uh, I, I don't want to say you can uh, out train your poor genetics or something like that, but it is, it is an interesting concept in, in, in that yeah. regard. So something else that struck me in, in that area, and I, I, I actually, I hate myself for the questions that I ask sometimes, but uh, like, how long do you think the, that, that, or do you have any indication how long that hypomethylation induced by the bout specifically may, may last? Um, I know obviously, and I've seen kind of more training style studies where you can see, you know, several weeks and perhaps beyond that. Um, but it, it was, it was interesting to me, to me to see such kind of, in some regions, quite striking hypomethylation from a single bout of exercise. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't know. Uh, I guess that is so uh, few data so far to be able to, to say, but um, uh, sorry, what was the first part again? The uh, yeah, yeah, it was. I, I mean, I, look, I realize it was a difficult question. More about the the the, the time course of so oh, you know, yeah, 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 of course, yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, remember. So yeah, I mean, I guess depends on how how frequently maybe that the, the stimulus will be because I imagine that. With all the, the, for example, histones as well, they turn, there is a turnover. So these modifications that occur in the DNA, there is, there is actually some kind of a, a turnover that goes, goes on. So if, if we train one bout and then, I don't know, you don't train again, I, I would imagine that those uh, ventilation patterns or histone uh, modifications will go away eventually, like when, when, there is a, the, the, when you expect a turnover to occur. So, uh, but I, I would imagine that with repeated bouts, the frequency in training, those methylation will remain, perhaps. But yeah, that, that's all related to turnover. So eventually, they they should. If you untrain, if you are untrained, maybe those uh, will will go. But again, I mean, there is this ma muscle memory effect that people believe that could, maybe those are more more long lived than we imagine, and, and they will remain for quite a will stick to for a while, maybe. But yeah, I mean, this is all very recent uh, data. We, we we don't know, but. That will be interesting to see, like for example, long uh, athletes that have trained for the entire entire life, how the RDNA promoter and other the other regions are when you train for uh, I don't know decades, you know. Um, just transitioning on, so M Michael Taggart from uh, the University of Newcastle has just um, beckered a question for you, uh, Vandre. Sorry, it's quite a long one, so I'm going to try to um, summarize it. Uh, he asks, when referring to increased ribosomal biogenesis, is it possible to measure ribosome quantity as well as molecular indicators of this from the biopsies um, through uh, 45S uh, RNA? Uh, and similarly, can you quantify for more ribosomal protein as well? Um, yeah, so um, yeah, I'm seeing the, the question as well. So uh, yeah, so ideally, 
uh, so we usually measure 45S pre-RNA because that's that's uh, what is the bottleneck step. But of course, for for you for the ribosomes for the ribosome genes to occur completely, you need to have the ribosomal proteins. So yeah, so uh, that's why, for example, um, mTOR, for example, mTOR complex one, when they increase translation, they increase translation of specific mRNAs, like what people call the top mRNAs, and those top mRNAs, ribosomal proteins are basically uh, top mRNAs. So uh, uh, once uh, in conjunction or in parallel to the increase in 45S, we also see increase in translation efficiency and, and most of them or a, a bunch of them will be ribosomal protein. So uh, that occurs as well. So all the, we have what, 80, 80 something protein, ribosomal proteins. Um, so all of them are increased, uh, specific, uh, actually not, not all of them, but uh, there is one that is actually not as um, increased as as, uh, as the, the other ones, but most of them are increased with translation efficiency following about that exercise. So yeah, so um, so confirming if ribosomal protein increases are distributed roughly equally to smart. Yeah, uh, we believe that yeah, that's the case. Uh, that all the ribosomal, both of the small and right, large ribosomal subunits are equally increased. We don't have, a, a, I guess, at this point anything to, to imagine that that's not the case. Although there, it's important to say that there is there might be some recycling of ribosomal proteins. So once a ribosomal degradation occurs, perhaps uh, some of the proteins might be recycled. That's a possibility as well. And and since we have muscle has its own version of some uh, one of the, the ribosomal proteins, it's possible that there's a conversion between specific ribosomal proteins in the new ribosomes. So uh, so that's an interesting question because. Uh, once you engage in resistance training, there is a chance that your new ribosomes will be different than the ones that you that you previously had based on the composition of the ribosomal protein. We, we don't know that. But we imagine that's the case. Uh, specifically, there is one protein, uh, ribosomal protein uh, L3, that's, uh, that is one that muscle has its specific version that might be different than, than the ones that you previously had once not uh, engaging in training. So uh, each new ribosome do you imagine it takes a little, quite a bit of the cell? Yes, that's correct. So it takes, a, oh, sorry, the question was, each new ribosome takes quite a bit of the cell resource to construct. Yeah, that's correct. So ribosome biogenesis is one of the most energy consum, uh, consum sorry, it's, it is basically a sink to energy uh, consumption, ribosome biogenesis. So both, I guess, actually both ribosome biogenesis and protein synthesis are the main uh, sink to energy, I guess, in a, in a, in a cell. So there is a lot of uh, a lot of resource going on towards ribosomal biogenesis for sure. And uh, is it possible that ribosomal protein is it possible that ribosomal proteins might have non-ribosomal functions? Absolutely, there, there is data showing that some ribosomes might might have other functions. Uh, that's not my expertise, but uh, I'm aware that there are uh, people researching non-ribosomal functions from from not from ribosomal proteins for sure. But yeah, so we have focused on the ribosomal functions for sure as well. But yeah, there, there, there are. There are. We're, we're just coming up on time before we, we transition into the, the, the breakout room. So um, maybe just as a, as a final question to close up, this is my one is uh, what's next? So uh, just, I mean, you've, there's obviously, because that was one of the things reading this paper, I was like, there's so many other avenues you could go down with this, you know, training studies or repeated acute bouts, or even like you alluded to earlier, perhaps cross-sectional work in people who have been training for years or decades, or do, do you, can you, are you at liberty to, uh, to tell us of your plans for anything in the future? Or I think the, the most, the, the very next thing to, that has to be done because this is a cute bout where you're just proposing a mechanism, but someone needs, or there needs to be uh, data, similar data to, to ours in a cute bout, but in the chronic uh, range. So is this increasing ribosome biogenesis acutely? Will it translate into actually muscle gains in the long term? So we, we believe that that's the case, but of course we need the evidence. So uh, we need data shown uh, that associated, like if you took those, those low uh, subjects with low and high copy numbers, if you train them with the same stimulus, will they actually eventually lead to differences in muscle hypertrophy in the long term? We believe, we believe of course, that, that will be the case because uh, uh, we are ribocentric, perhaps. 
but uh, uh, we believe that that will be the case. But uh, it, it needs to be done. I think this research needs to. And uh, uh, I mean, of course, that there is a bunch of data already on on muscle growth. So if there is DNA available, perhaps it's just uh, you can do retrospectively see whether the high responders were high copy number subjects or the other way around. So this, I think this is the very next thing that has to be done. But also uh, working mice as well. There is, we, we have as well some data on, on mice on the RDNA copy number side. So uh, there is a lot to be done. I think this is just, I guess, the beginning, but um, I think we'll, we'll get there. All right, perfect. Um, I think on that note, we, we might conclude that the main portion of the session. Uh, Ro Rosie, are you putting a link in the, the chat there or uh, is it just a case that I can't see it? Um, I'm just about to paste it now. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Um, so I guess just while Rosie's doing that, uh, I'll convey my thanks again for a third time to, to Vandre uh, for giving us a great presentation on a, a tr truly interesting paper and uh, Bettina as well for uh, coming on, giving up your time and, and providing us with um, your insight as well. It's uh, much appreciated. I think we had a, a great discussion and a great session. Uh, for anyone who's interested in uh, coming along for the next uh, 15 minutes to half an hour to, to have a more informal conversation, um, please feel free to click the link below and uh, we can um, converse more informally afterwards. All right. Uh, thank, you thank you very much.